Wolfenstein 3D revolutionized the word immersion and the art of perspective when it was released in 1992. But it wasn't the first game to reform the word viewpoint. In 1991, John Carmack and id Software released what is arguably the first ever mainstream version of a three-dimensional game, Catacomb 3D. It was an MS-DOS game powered by IBM's EGA graphics, which at the time looked incredible and something we never saw before. Catacomb 3D gained notoriety for its implementation of showing the actual hand of the player, which was not used just to make the game more immersive, but because it helped players judge distance in the game space, a concept never before explored so intimately in a game. Coupled with the traditional camera technique of making objects appear larger when approaching the foreground, players could judge distance accurately to avoid taking damage and navigate the maze-like environments without running into walls. It was the first time where the words spatial awareness were uttered, a term that had very little relevance before the creation of first-person games. Prior to 3D and first-person video games, it was like playing with dolls, Carmack once said. In a typical video game at the time, your character was maybe 16 by 16 pixels in an overhead view. Maybe it did some cute things to make you smile, but you were still controlling this very tiny thing on the screen. Perspective was never an issue with games leading up to Catacomb 3D. The game space inside an overhead or 2D side-scrolling game never required it as players saw everything they needed from the bird's eye viewpoint. Challenge in these games was brought on by the environment instead such as avoiding pitfalls below jumps, or dodging projectiles from enemies, or in a lot of cases, just trying to get around the environment and navigate to the next area. Changing the perspective from a side-scrolling game to a third-person view, or swapping from overhead to first-person, changes everything. No longer are we safe from that peanut gallery all-seeing view. Vulnerability is now a factor. Now we had to actually look behind us in order to see where enemies were and if we were going to get ambushed. And later on, when audio cues were put into games, we had to use those too, anything we had to gain awareness. Perspective changes everything, and we got our first real taste of it with Wolfenstein a year later in 1992. Although simplistic at first glance, mazes were an amazing way to create value for games because they were the natural counterpoint to hardware limitations. Developers like Carmack understood that they could only fit so much into early first-person shooter technology, so the best way around it was to build mazes in their games to artificially inflate game length and effort required by the player. Developers could use these mazes to hide things, power-ups and health pickups, which would be necessary for the balance of game difficulty. Players who fully explored each maze were rewarded with things that made their journey forward easier. But mazes did something more important, to create the illusion of reality given the lack of player visibility. Enemies could be dropped in behind the player to create surprises or scares, or simply generate more gameplay in any given room the player entered, something that would have looked very odd in an overhead game. And this had a very real direct impact on the future of technology for video games. Developers realized that they only needed to render what was in front of the player and save memory by creating the illusion of the world that was fully 3D, when in fact, behind the player, there was nothing at all. But when Half-Life was introduced in 1998, everything changed. Do not attempt to open the doors until the train has come to a complete halt at the station platform. Story, narration, and puzzles were added to the shooting to expand upon immersion, and it was in this era that we really saw the potential for the first-person storytelling experience. It was in this period when the first-person genre was at its peak, where gameplay, level design, discovery, and story came together so beautifully to form something truly special. And the best part about this formula was that it had a direct impact on game flow, allowing developers to weave in and out between action, downtime, cutscenes, story bits, keeping players on their toes and delivering new experiences at any moment. It was an amazing, amazing time to be a PC first-person shooting fan.
Things would need to be toned down and devolved for the console market to accommodate the changes in hardware, an era of levels. Games like GoldenEye that sold over 7 million copies on the Nintendo 64 started popping up, the first true taste of level-based first-person console shooting. Leading up to GoldenEye, narrative first-person shooters like Half-Life on the PC were presented kind of like how a good book is written. Introduction and a tutorial, action, climax, defeat, and triumph. It's a storyboard designed played out in many films, books, and games. However, it didn't translate to consoles in the same way. Levels were a good way to condense larger worlds like Half-Life into games that consoles could actually handle given their hardware capacity. Developers like Rare discovered that this was a more approachable format given the audience of consoles anyway, allowing them to build these kind of mini stories in games like Perfect Dark within each level to align with couch TV gaming habits of non-PC gamers. And finally, Aim Assist was also introduced for console gamers to make up for the inherent inaccurateness of controller joysticks. It was a necessary evil seeing as how clunky the aim systems were in those early console shooters. Five years after GoldenEye, the modern military shooter craze would take over the genre and the industry as a whole. Call of Duty was born and became successful by refining that control given to the player, making their games easily accessible and just quick fun. Achieving mass appeal in the video game economy requires you to meet players right where they interact with their games, the controller. Call of Duty did just that, becoming the most successful video game franchise of all time. But there was a price to pay for Call of Duty. Let's not forget what Call of Duty really did to the industry. It gave rise to the linear corridor shooter. It took the level-based designs of earlier console shooters and condensed them even further into railway corridor maps. Although they do have their benefits and many people like them, corridor shooters are the plague for people wanting new experiences in first-person gaming. How many times have we played the same old Call of Duty campaign? Why is Battlefield Bad Company 2 the only decent campaign in the series? And why are there so many games that have cloned this linear formula? Will we ever get back to where it all began? A few games have tried, including the Shadow Warrior franchise, trying to revitalize the arena maze levels of the past. Other games have tried to introduce emotion like Homefront, yet went down in flames for failing to create anything truly original succumbing to the fates of so many other linear, modern military games just like it. Other games lean on themes or settings such as science fiction with Battlefront, but they are in themselves guilty of indulging the mass market, the low recoil, high paced linear gameplay design made so prevalent by Call of Duty. And then there's the games that do just the opposite. The Far Cry Machine, the engine that keeps cranking out huge open world shooters, although they are just as guilty as any other linear shooter is. Game design repeated over and over and over, resulting in the same game no matter what version you're playing. And then there's the new versions of games like Doom and Wolfenstein, examples of how to properly evolve the classic formula while still appeasing today's market. Bioshock is also an interesting direction for first-person shooters, displaying how to bridge classic shooting mechanics with supernatural powers without ruining the authenticity of a sophisticated narrative. And a series like Metro showing us how darkness, twisted storylines, and the use of limited resources, ammunition that doesn't just pop out of nowhere, and oxygen systems that need to be managed can create that immersion that we once felt with the classic shooters of the 90s. But no matter the direction, it's a genre with so many possibilities and a direct reflection of our own lives as people. We live in the first person, so it's only fitting that the most popular genre on the planet involves doing just that, existing in the first person. What does the future look like for the first person genre? I want you to tell me that in the comment section below. And thanks for watching guys, if you enjoyed this video, by all means hit the thumbs up button for me and subscribe here for more of our future content, and you guys have a kick-ass day.